Let's get going. We're, uh, we're running out of time here. And we have a lot to cover. We want to make sure you get the most out of this. <laughs> Welcome to the panel on crowdsourced fundraising uh, for art projects. Uh, my name is Will Chase. I work for Burning Man. <laughs> Pritchett, and I can introduce them right now. Um, we're going to focus this panel as much as possible on your questions, so get your questions up in, up in your mind. Um, we're going to have these guys share their uh, extraordinary wisdom and experience with uh, fundraising for our projects, and we're very happy to have them here. Um, so my experience with like, why am I sitting here at all, I'm a writer as well, as far as you know. Um, I have a lot of experience building art projects as well as uh, doing fundraising for them and uh, helping other people with their fundraising for projects. I've run an event, uh, event management service uh, on my own that is, uh, I've been doing a lot of uh, silent auctions and live auctions and fundraising events and producing those and, and helping others do that over the years. So I have a lot of experience with different sides of fundraising, both from the, you know, being a fundraiser and also creating the art and also promoting people's fundraisers through the Jack Rabbit Speaks and other things like that. Uh, I manage all, all of Burning Man's external facing communication. So. I, I work with a lot of artists on promoting their fundraisers. So I have about 10 years experience uh, dealing with fundraising for art, um, and I'm lucky enough to know these fine ladies. Um, Jess Hobbs is an ontological engineer and <laughs> hacking the reality of constructing worlds. She has worn, she's worn many hats, running and creating community art programs, counseling teenagers, curating, and exhibiting, designing, photographing, creating biomass engineering, energy systems and playing with some girls who love lipstick and accelerants. You might have heard of those uh, she had, as an, She's an MFA graduate from the San Francisco Art Institute and has been designing and creating large-scale art around the world for well over a decade. She believes collaboration is key in the community and art, and this can be seen through the work of her nonprofit Flux Foundation and her company All Power Labs. So welcome, Jess Hobbs. We are also very lucky to have Annie Critchett with us. Uh, Annie, Annie's the uh, executive producer of the Daylights Project. Have you guys heard about the Daylights Project? Yeah. 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 Amazing. She just, uh, as part of that, she managed to raise $7 million wow. to make that project. project and, uh, and still counting. Still counting. Still counting. Um, so she led the development and management of Leo Villarreal's largest artwork to date. Uh, during that project, she built community, grew international awareness, and assembled a world-class team to produce this complex and highly creative ongoing event. Uh, she's the executive director of the Daylights Presenting Organization, Illuminate the Arts, and co-directed the launch of Zero One, the Art Technology Network, and its biannual International Arts Festival. Um, she was one of the founding, uh, founding team that uh, built Wire Magazine. So, we got a good panel for her fundraising. So, so one of the prerequisites for this um, for this panel was uh, to have listened to my workshop on uh, fundraising for our projects. I've done that project, that, that talk now three times, twice at the Birdman office and once at the regional, at the Global Leadership Conference last year. Um, did any of, the, any of you folks attend that? No? Okay. Um, so that all covers uh, that talk that you guys should take a look at if, you're, you, know, if you haven't yet. Um, covers all the nuts and bolts and the logistics of, of basic fundraising, like everything you need to know in terms of strategies and, and tips and tricks and stuff like that. What we're the, the reason we want you to listen to that is because in this in this panel, we would rather focus on your questions and the experience of these two uh, to to bring to bear. So going into like their best best advice and best hints and tricks and tips on, on how to do effective fundraising uh, for whatever you're doing. So. Um, let's. Yes. So it, it, it's on the on the Pathable site that you guys are all aware of the, through the GLC uh, website. There's a there's a link to it on there. It's on the it's on the Burning blog. So the Burning Man blog. Um, okay. So let's get started. I'm gonna ask, ask a series of questions to to our panelists and, and get uh, get their uh, best answers. So first off, what are the arrows in your standard fundraising equipment? What techniques do you find uh, best and most effective for fundraising for our projects? Well, thanks for having me. Well, it's great to be here with Jess. Um, first and foremost, the most important thing is the people that you surround yourself 
with, just like anything in life. Um, and a slight modification to your description of my role, so as the executive producer, I actually had the honor of surrounding myself with incredible development people. So um, I think part of my story is that development is a key component to this incredible art-making endeavor, but it's one of many. And so it's very important to surround yourself by people that are smarter than you are at what they do. And so I don't know how many of you know Dorothy Keene, but she is a longtime burner and a longtime art activist and an incredible development person. Um, to raise, actually, on another question, we raised 6.3 million, looking forward to 27, um, of our $8 million budget in less than a year. And in order to do that, absolutely, it was imperative to have someone like Dorka Keene on board who was able to travel through the development um, world with grace and bravery and really to leverage and honor her most sacred arrows in her quiver, which is her relationships. Um, Christina Harbridge, who's one of my dearest friends and another long-time early days burner, one of her favorite quotes, which I live by, is, relationships are the most important currency. So with Dorka, certainly with me, in what I needed to do in order to pull up the Bay Lights, it's really about your forward-facing relationships. And I managed all the crowd-sourced endeavors and the social media and um, grassroots efforts around the Bay Lights. And of that, of our $6.3 million, we've raised about 250000 Again, in a short amount of time and amazing, and I think that's where we'll focus this conversation. Um, okay, now that my quivers. Um, I want to say ditto with the relationships. I think those are key. Um, I also found, um, since when we build a lot of our projects, um, the projects I built with the Flaming Lotus Girls and the projects I'm currently building with Flex Foundation, it's also to elevate the role of fundraising to as important in, as any of the other endeavors of the project. The, you know, who's ever doing the metal work, whoever's doing the woodwork, sometimes they, they get kind of elevated above everybody else, but I felt the key effort and the key thing that we did, especially during the, the temple fundraising, was the fundraising group was a team. And when we did vignettes with the little teams in video, we actually focused on them. Because we brought in, um, I don't know if I can say it, I'm not allowed. We brought in two thirds of our budget. Um, and that total budget was close to $200,000. So the next question I have is, uh, of those of those arrows in your quiver, uh, which are the most successful financially? And I'm differentiating that from uh, the corollary question, which is, which of those were most successful overall for your project? In other words, in terms of ongoing relationship development, community development, because there's, there's certain kinds of fundraising where you just have one dude that drops a big ton of, you know, truck of money on your project, and that's great, and you can make, you make it financially. If you have that dude, then good for you. But as you're saying, like the, pe the people you surround yourself with and the team that you have, um, how do you manage, which of these techniques do you think um, furthers your overall further development in the future? Well, luckily I have actually one of those dudes who, I don't know how many of you know the story of the Daylights, but part of the way we were able to achieve this extraordinary, ridiculously huge, goal was we have an anonymous patron who gave us $3.5 million. And I, had, I had the um, honor of picking up that check at a cafe on Filmer Street. <laughs> but then, of course, part of that was with the promise that we would be able to raise the rest. And we're still actively trying to do that. Um, so, I think another part of that answering the question about the quiver, which is then what is the most important thing, is also have a kick-ass project. Like really have something that people are passionate about and understand that 
different people have different passions, and so to be strategic and be appropriate and be superhuman about the way that you talk very directly to folks to ask for their help. Um, I found, I also done fundraising um, for, in the political circles, and um, really by leaning into your relationships and being really clear, you know, people who are generous are decision makers, they're, you know, it's a dollar, it's a hundred dollars, it's still an important conversation to have, and it's important to be very transparent and very vocal, and really to ask. A lot of people get to ask. Um, yeah, that, that asking part. I don't know how many people saw the TED Talk by Amanda Palmer. Um, if you haven't, go, go see it. She really clearly finds the passion that she found through asking and how that really kind of escalated her fundraising and her ability to do what she did. Um, I was just thinking that, um, asking, okay, how to train a fund, and Amanda was kind of railroaded me. Um, <laughs> straightforward and allowing yourself to be a little bit vulnerable because these projects are your passion. They're like you are letting yourself on the line, you're putting your dreams, you're putting your vision. It's okay to say that. And it's okay to like put your heart out there and say, I believe in this project, I believe in what we're doing, I believe in the community, I believe in everything we've put together. And I will take that money and ask them, I need this much money. <laughs> be very clear with that. And I will bring that entire community and drive that forward through this project and it's going to come to fruition and you will be a part of that. And bring them into the community. Um, but vulnerability is actually key in this as well. I'll actually amplify that and add to it um, the idea that of asking for the money it, and the idea of you know bringing people, good people around you. One of the things I always tell people is have somebody doing your fundraising that's not on your core art project. In other words, they're not responsible for the main parts of the, of the art. Because as long as they're doing fundraising, the art is suffering, and vice versa. If they're doing art, then the fundraising is, is, is suffering. Um, have that person be someone who's really good at asking for money. Um, I suck at asking for money, and I'm aware of that. And so I bring good people around me who can ask for that money. Um, and, you know, Finding the right target audience, finding the right people, understanding what their triggers are, right? Understanding what it is that they are passionate about um, about their project. It might be something that you're not aware of. It might not be, you know, clunking a, a big piece of steel down in a public place. They might be interested in how you're working with kids to teach them welding skills and, and to to help them grow personally as part of your project. Um, it could be any number of things. With so more dimensions you can show about your project, and the more you can identify who you're trying to, who your target audience is for fundraising, what their interest is and what their passion is, you can really directly ask them in a way that it's going to really, you know, touch their heart and make them want to win a lot for you. Are you going to take questions Sorry, yes, we're going to, well, we're, we're going to take questions at the end of the moment. We'll, we'll, we're going to try and allow as much time as possible, so yes, queue up your questions. Um, actually, what's your name? I'm Jeffrey from Santa Cruz. Jeff, we'll put your name up on the board. So we'll have a queue of questions here. Um, thank you, Rachel. Uh, so what, I'm, I'm gonna jump around on the questions a little bit here, but what are the, what are the biggest fundraising mistakes? Like what are the things that you've, <laughs> that you've tried in the past and just like realized that, that ultimately it was uh, more of a waste of time than not? Mistakes are good. <laughs> Um, I think sometimes, especially with doing projects, um, some of the projects for Burning Man is um, you get into this cycle of creating a party, um, a fundraising party, and especially with um, bigger groups like Flaming Lotus Girls, um, everybody wants to contribute something and everybody has an amazing idea. It's having enough leadership to realize what ideas are going to take too much time and money and actually um, 
not really contribute back to the community. Um, and it's, it's kind of taking the cream, the cream of the crop or the best ideas. It's, it's parties that get too kind of diversified, too unfocused, and there's just too much going on and too many people involved. And it, it's being, not being afraid to say no to certain things and saying no politely, saying that's a great idea and we should put it in our bucket list in our, you know, our, in our quiver, <laughs> and we should bring that out some other time. It's, um, yeah, not being afraid to say no. To echo that, and really to edit. So you edit your strategy, but you also edit, I mean, I tend to be a little chatty in my emails over state things, and, you know, it's like really be mindful, you know, of the, we, with the Bay Lights, we do, um, uh, a series of newsletters, and, and, and we've kept our community updated, our growing community updated as we go. And boy, we say a lot. You know, I get tired of reading my own stuff all the time. So really be mindful of your audience and, um, you know, be direct. And so in terms of your strategy and how you spend your money and make your money, but certainly in how you, you know, approach your conversation with your, with your community. Um, I'd also say that, you know, certainly another mistake that happens a lot with fundraising is you forget to ask. Because it's easier sometimes not to ask. <laughs> it's like, it's more comfortable, that's for sure. You can all just sort of sit around and have a drink together. Um, yeah, the, a lot of the pitfalls that I see are um, asking for too much money, um, like asking, like having such a big budget for something that doesn't warrant that budget. Um, that it becomes untenable, um, asking for too little, like you know, figuring out what you really need to ask, in other words, really knowing what your budget is in a realistic way so that you can actually pull off the project once you've gotten the money that you've asked for, so you don't have to go back to the till, as it were, and to get kind of embarrassed by saying, oh, well, actually, I don't have enough to do this after all, and it's more. Um, and yeah, asking too often or asking too seldom. Um, if you ask too much, there's a lot of it becomes sig you know, there's a sig signal to noise ratio. And this is what a very good fundraiser um, will know sort of instinctively. So a lot of it's just instinct of knowing you know, what feels right and what doesn't. Um, that's why I say bring somebody on who's really good at this and, and knows the techniques and knows how to, to get it done. Um, so yeah, and asking, you know, asking too early or asking too late. So if you ask too early in your project before you really, really know what it is that it's really going to cost, that can that can become embarrassing and if you ask too late, it's going to be probably too late. I've had the experience of having to fundraise for projects after they're done and up, and that's <laughs> more uncomfortable and difficult, um, and especially after you, after you burn them. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that, could be, that could be a problem too. <laughs> it's like, hey, I'm fundraising, give me some money for that thing that was there. <laughs> so, um, those are some of the mistakes that I commonly see from, uh, from people. The biggest one though that I've seen is, is having your fundraiser be the, someone that's too integral to your art project, and it just become the, the person just gets worn to the bone. It's pretty, it, it, it gets pretty ugly. Um, what kind of what kind of experience do you guys? Um, Bay Lakes is a nonprofit, correct? Yes, Illuminate the Arts. Illuminate the Arts, is, and Flux Foundation is a nonprofit. What experience could you guys directly uh, can, can you contribute around? Uh, Fundraising again in a nonprofit scenario. Is there a specific stuff that, that comes into play that's, that these folks should know? Running a nonprofit's really hard because you're always, always asking. You're not a profit. You have no profit to rely on. Um, so, but just like any business, you run it as a business and um, just stay, you know, have a clear mission and stay true to it. Feature creep is easy, but not the right thing to do. And I can relate to what you just said about, I mean, we're still raising money. And so the Bay Lights is on every night for the next two years, but we're still raising money to pay for the installation process let alone the maintenance and removal and everything else. So I hear you about how that changes the conversation. Um, yeah, I mean, there's this 
I, I, if you don't run a nonprofit, there is this idea of like nonprofit is the key to all your pillows because people will give more. And actually, I haven't really seen that versus like um, fundraising with an LLC or just a group. Um, there's the benefit you get to thank your donors with a tax deductible donation, but there's a lot of overhead and maintenance of the nonprofit outside of the art project. A lot of things. And you have to have all your finances in a row because auditing is like a looming thing. It's always active. Is, is that pretty common to see the audits for oh, yeah. audit no, the No, it's 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 yes. Every <laughs> every no matter every year. Every year? Every year. It's awesome. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Um, so if you guys had one piece of advice to to deliver to folks about fundraising, what would that be? What would be your, your key takeaway? Just love what you do, and people will love on you. And 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 it's okay for people to say no. You know, not everyone's going to love the project. Not everyone's going to understand it. And um, but that and that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Nobody, you know, always asks. Um, people will say no. Don't let that deter you. I think sometimes you can ask and ask and, you know, you get no after no after no. But people might have legitimate reasons that they want to give it to you, but they just can't. Um, so keep asking. Um, and always, always, always thank your donors. Like, even if you're a year late, just thank your donors. Give them a little gesture because they believe in you and thanking them for believing you is absolutely key for them to return, to tell their friends, to grow your donor community. Yeah, I'll echo that. When we built the Panhandle Band Shell back in 2007, um, I managed that project and also a lot of the fundraising for it. Uh, and one thing we made sure to do was on our website, we thanked every single one of our donors, whether it was financial or uh, material donations that they made. Uh, and that went somewhere. You know, it, it just, it, it's showing the follow through, it shows professionalism, it shows that you do appreciate them. Um, you don't necessarily have to give swag in that kind of instance, or, you know, to or, or a sticker or a button or whatever. It's just like having the, you know, the, the awareness out in the world that these folks were, were supporting you, they're gonna, want, they're gonna want to come back potentially and, and support you in the future or tell, tell their friends about you. And it really makes a big difference. It's, it's really, a lot of it is relationship development um, and gaining the trust of the people that you're asking them asking for money, that you're going to be able to do what, you're going to, what you say you're going to do. Um, so they feel confident that you're going to, that you're going to do something right with their money. Um, so I want to go back, if I could, to, uh, like the because we have a little bit of time for John Good. Uh, I want to go back to the arrows and the quiver and the different techniques, the, the specific fundraising techniques that are out there, and what you found successful or not. Um, so I think Kickstarter is extraordinarily popular. Um, and Indiegogo in terms of like online crowdsourced fundraising. Um, there's also things like events, you know, throwing an actual fundraiser with, with friends and stuff like that. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of different stuff in between. What is your what is your sense of the landscape these days with regard to um, with regard to Kickstarter and and particularly donor fatigue around around the Kickstarter phenomenon? If you have a sense of that. I'll talk about that Kickstarter. So um, we started using Kickstarter when we did the template. Um, and I think that was the year before it really kicked in with a lot of, um, especially for women's projects. Um, so, and especially if you're doing a temple project that has a little bit more ability to raise greater funds. Um, it was a wonderful, amazing way to uh, raise money quickly. And it gives a goal, it gives each person who, you know, I think everybody can Kickstarter. Um, there is some fatigue with it though. And um, what was you start were, some good. Start some good. So I there's already some other crowdsourcing ones that I think are more appropriate that um, are focusing on nonprofits or arts. And I think Kickstarter is key, but there's some other really interesting ones that are developing. Um, and you can't raise as much anymore. And I think some people are sort of getting sick of all the schwag. It's like you get so many notes to remind you to reply to get your baggage wagon. Really, in the end, I don't always care. 
Um, yeah, we, we actually didn't do very well on Kickstarter. Um, well, and part of it was just ridiculous the size of my budget. But um, we used, very successfully, we were approached by um, the very secret Dead Rat Society, which I don't know how many of you guys know about, but it's um, Bernie Man and the Exploratorium <coughs> and Maker Fair and Crucible and some others came together and wanted to figure out how to coalesce their incredible reach in the community, and they approached us to be their first experiment. And so each of those amazing organizations helped us with um, some of our initial grassroots outreach. Thank you, Well, um, And so we didn't have a time to really figure it out and be the resources to build anything, so we used Causes, which is a Facebook crowdsourcing situation. We've raised about $40,000, and it's a grow, like a grow, you know, 25 bucks at a time. And it's just been our constant well for people, because it's not time-based, and it's not project-based, it's, it's sort of like build, build, build. We then um, built our own backend, um, I'm very proud of a campaign that I started called A Gift of Light, and um, I really wanted y'all to be able to buy, like buying a star, you can actually buy a light on the bridge. And um, so we needed to um, partner, which is another quote, by the way, that we have talked about is your partnerships. Who are your partners? They're amazing what they do. So I partnered with some developers who built this incredible interface where you can literally go on the bridge, you can pick a light, you can put a profile up, etc. Um, we raised about 150000 through that campaign because people feel connected to it. My goal was that you can see yourself in the Bay Bridge, in the Bay Lights when you're looking at the Bay Bridge. That's my goal. Um, but we're also about to launch another crowdsourcing campaign called Light Night on Rally.org, which is another crowdfunding backend. And um, the idea around Rally is similar to Kickstarter in that it's connecting rallies around a particular initiative. And this one is um, if one chooses to donate themselves or to rally $2,000, they will own a night of the Bay Lights. So you and your group or whoever you're dedicated to will be the patron of the Bay Lights for that evening. So to rally, yay, haven't launched it yet. Causes has been good. Facebook is Facebook part makes it a little clunky. Um, and get started in process. So we made our own. I'm glad you brought that up, the, the pick, a, pick your light thing, because that was something I wanted to actually uh, address here. It's like, it's a really great example of being creative in terms of how you're asking for money. Um, because there is a real problem right now with the signal to noise ratio and noise fatigue out there. Um, because Kickstarter has become so popular, not just within the burning room arena, but you know, across so many other kinds of projects that it's becoming the sort of everyone's doing it. Everybody has an easy opportunity to ask for money so they're all doing it. So where do you put your dollar, right? Um, how do you rise, you know, for you as a fundraiser, the question becomes how do you now rise above that noise um, and sort of signal, uh, single yourself out and, and draw attention? And that was a really great way to do that because I actually, I mean, I'm a, I'm a completely jaded asshole when it comes to you know, giving money at this point. <laughs> and I was like, that resonated with me. I saw that. I was like, I would like to buy, you know, buy one for my kid. Uh, and that was like a, a new way to hook on to, so, suddenly you have people, you're offering them a new way to hook on to your project emotionally. Um, and that's going to really, that's going to really set yourself apart and be more successful. It's, it's awesome to hear you got 150000 out of that. That's, that's great. Yes, it's just, I mean, it's a churn. Um, so know your audience, know, you know, and really be creative in, in terms of how you reach them. And, and what is it about your project that's going to resonate with people in what way, and how can you cast it differently? One thing that some I've seen projects do is um, take a specific, in a similar way, take a specific piece of it and say, like, let's say it's a, let's say it's a temple with a tower with a, with a spire on it. And you can say, okay, I'm looking for this much money, and you're going to help us build that spire. So that spire is going to be your some some people really resonate. <coughs> some people really resonate with 
contributing to a specific piece of the project so they can point to it and say that it's, you know, that they contributed to that rather than just the whole thing generically. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different ways to, to uh, fundraise for, for projects. Some are going to be sort of generalist crowdsourcing things that are like a bucket, like Kickstarter and whatnot, are going to be like a bucket that you can just like have people throw in their, their, their money into it. And then there's the ones that are going to be much more um, specific to your particular experience and developing relationships with people out in the world that um, will help you in a collaborative way, both financially and materially, um, and growing your community, growing your, the number of connections that you have around your project. Um, because those will those will amplify over time, right? Those will you you know it's 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 getting into that ne network. Um, so doing events can be really expensive, right? So doing an actual fundraising event, you can plenty of loads girls does a ton of them. Um, they can be really expensive, but there's really a great value. And I would love if you talked about that a little bit. Um, a great value in doing that in terms of that community, you know, being able to press hands and see people face to face and not just you know drop money into a bucket on, online. It's more anonymous. Um, but they're also you know, what's what's your sense of a return on investment in terms of like the impact on your team and the impact financially and, and actually how much you make out of it. Yeah, parties are kind of that um, double-edged sword. Um, they take like especially if you're doing the parties as you're doing. So they're taking a huge capacity out of actually, you know, especially if you're on a deadline, like if it's a Burning Man project, you're like, I have until the first week in August to really get this done. So it takes capacity out of building. So you have to weigh those options. Um, what kind of party or what kind of events do you want to have? Um, while catered parties and kind of high-end stuff like that are really fun, they take a huge amount of planning and they're the most risky unless you actually understand your audience enough to know that like you have the capacity to pull that off. Um, you know, sometimes just a very straightforward, like, fun party with some DJs everybody loves, you know, but when we did fundraising for the temple, we partnered with a lot of the bigger sound camps that go to Burning Man. Um, one of the main um, founders of Flux is also part of Space Cowboys, so we kind of, we had an in. Um, so, we really relied on that part of our community to help us do the fundraising, and that's another thing. It's like, who are your partners? Um, maybe you don't have the capacity within your group, and maybe that's important not to be directly related to those who are building. Um, who are your partners that can help you throw a party? Who is your friend that owns a restaurant that could do like 10% of the proceeds for one night? Um, or we did a lot of, um, small fundraisers like we did uh, that were pretty successful. They brought in $10,000 for small ones where we knew somebody who owned a bar and they gave us like the proceeds or you know 50% of the proceeds for a Sunday afternoon, which is kind of not a big time for them, but we threw it out to our community and like they had a great, they had a very profitable day and so did we. Um, and sometimes it's less is more when you're doing Showcase a little of what you're doing. Give them tantalizing little tidbits of like, here's a little example of what's going to happen. Um, but don't go overboard. Don't put all your energy into it. A couple really, I think, good points in that is the benefit of a party, and this is kind of back to sort of fundraising 101, is the peer-to-peer -peer opportunity. So, as you can imagine, in this past year for the Daylights, you know, we've had some pretty fancy peer-to-peer -peer situations, and you have to have a peer, you know, you have to have someone with those relationships. You can't, you can't make that up, right? But so, you know, in that sense, like, we really needed to deliver these really incredibly excruciating, really beautiful experiences, because the folks that were in the room expect that, and then reward that. Um, oh, Jennifer Razor just left, but we did an event where, I don't know how many of you know Jennifer, she's fabulous, and her mother is even that much more fabulous. And Helen was like, honey, we need to hand deliver the books with the LEDs outside of them, and I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> but it, you know, it was part of, you know, it was part of being in that peer-to-peer -peer, um, situation. So, yes, events 
can be very resource intensive, but they can also create opportunities for those sorts of um, connections. Then to your point about the proceeds, which is amazing. So the Bay Lights is activating the waterfront in a way that those businesses have never experienced before. Mm -hmm. So I now have all these relationships with all our business activation network where literally percentage of the proceeds, gold fleet is doing that cruise once a week. The water bar called me, she's like, what can I do? I have got to pay you guys back. We can, no one can get a table. Yes. So, they yeah. are. Yeah, that's a really good example of those partnerships that you can create and understanding, again, those are donations. You know, the, the donations that those folks are going to make that you are, that your project is going to impact somehow. Um, whether it's material donations that they make or fundraising donations, like say they you know, hosted a dinner for you or something like that. Those are relationships that, um, but that's a completely different ask. I mean, that's not just going out to, you know, a generic, uh, on a Kickstarter, going out on social, on, on your Facebook page and saying, hey, give us some money for this cool project. It's going to those people and knowing what their hook is, right? Knowing what their, what, you know, what's going to interest them. So I'm going to be bringing people into your restaurant because they're going to come and watch. So how can you help us make this happen? So it's, it's a completely different aspect. So think, it sounds cliche because it is, think outside the box. Really think creatively about you know, who your audience is and how you're going to approach them and, and, and you know, be able to rise above the noise and be able to get money out of people that you wouldn't otherwise be able to. Um, so that's the end of my questions right now. So we'd love to turn it to you guys and your questions. Um, and we'll start with Jeff. And, and it, actually, this is April. She's going she's gonna to queue us up. So if, if you want to just shout out your names real quick, you can write Jill. them down. Michelle? Jill. Jill. Dimitri. Sam. Sam. Warren. Warren. Hey you. Hey you. Esquire. Esquire. Mine just coming up for Hey You. That's that was it. Esquire. Okay. Okay, Jeff. Hi. Um, you kind of, you were talking about you know how um, it's important not to have the artist be asking for money. And then you said we well, need to find somebody that's good at that. Well, how would you describe the ideal person that's good at asking for money? I mean, what is, what is their qualities? That, and then, and how do you find that person? Because usually, it's <laughs> yeah, that development is hard. So that person is ballsy and direct and um, gregarious. Gregarious. And can take rejection, absolutely. Um, which is different to your point. When you know an artist being rejected is a different experience than a development person or a your good friend who's not afraid to ask for you. I mean, I think there's different ways to skin a cat, so to speak. But um, oh, Ray Rich and Roxanne, when we talk about development people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'd say somebody who's gregarious, because you might even know this person. This person might be a good business person, sales person. It's a little bit of that personality. It's also somebody who, who understands the vision of whatever project and who has the passion. You know, that's really key. Um, and you probably do know this person. And you might not, it might not be obvious right away. They need to be organized. Yeah. I would say I would add on to that um, somebody who has the technical skills be able to pull it off, so a, a really keen and exhaustive awareness and understanding of social media and uh, fundraising tools and um, a really good sense of uh, the community in which you are fundraising, so getting a sense of what, you know, what messages are going to attract them and what aren't. Um, have someone who has those relationships in place already, you know, so, you know there are people who just like run in those kinds of circles. Um, Somebody who's, you know, good at event planning or knows, you know, knows people who, who can. Just somebody who has, like, all, all those quivers that you were, you know, all those areas of quivers that we were talking about. Somebody who has the ability to, you know, to work with all of them. It's, it's a rare, it, it is a rare individual, but they are out there. And some people, you know, grow into the role. Especially with Burning Man projects that typically they're not making money. You know what I mean? That's true. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. Um, Jill. Yes. Um, I'm from El Paso, which we, we um, have the 
the claim of being the, the childhood home of Leo Gay Ariel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We're proud of that. And, um, but my question has to do with sponsors. Um, when we have a project, like for instance, the Burning Man project, and we have a, a big company called Western Refining, and they donate a lot of money, but we wouldn't want to call it the, the Western Refining um, Daylight Project. So, you know, they're the big fundraiser. So, how do you handle those kinds of sponsors when it's a big sponsor? Like and that? Will, could you repeat the question? Because we couldn't hear it. Back. Sure, the question is about sponsors. And, and what was the second part? Well, how do you recognize sponsors that give a lot of money, more than half of the project, without actually calling it the, the Western Refining Baylight Project? So how do you recognize and appreciate those sponsors without calling your project the, you know, Chevron right. <laughs> Well, we have some experience with those conversations. Um, a very fabulous luxury car company wanted to give us $3 million. And um, part of their expectations was naming rights. And it just was never on the table. So, um, also, it's just about being clear. It's really about, I mean, we, you know, Baylights is art in the purest form. And so, we're very clear around recognition is, is can be a slippery slope. And so that's why you want to, especially when you're dealing with sponsorship people, you're dealing with savvy business people, and you just want to be super clear. You do not want to get in the wrong relationship. So um, we are creating ways to fill our fundraising gap that include opportunities to be associated with the project, what I, what I call our off-bridge projects. So we're building audience, we're building global awareness, we're building education programs, that are around the experience of the Bay Lights. And in those scenarios, if Verizon, for example, who's quite interested, is one of our partners, we may have a Verizon program associated to the Bay Lights, but it's not the project itself. I would say that um, creating sponsorship packages, that's one of the, the skills that a good fundraiser would have if they're sort of, if they play in that, in that realm of fundraising. Um, and you have very specific, like this level and above, and this level to this level gets this, um, you know, recognition on our website of your logo this size versus you know, just a listing. If you're a just go to any museum, you'll see, like on the, you know, the, the wall, you'll see the different donors of different sizes have, you know, different size, you know, their name in different size fonts. Um, so if you have that package, that, 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 that you, all your sponsorship package is all laid out pretty clearly, none of them say you get to name the project. <laughs> <laughs> that, that will, it's a good way to sort of start the ball rolling in that way. And if you'd like, I'd be happy to share our package with you so you can see how we talk to corporations and, and, and really lean into it. Like we really want to be good partners, and but being a good partner means being clear about expectations. Is that something you post on the topical site? Yeah, I think that's Yeah, for sure. It's a file sharing. Sure. Um, so, next question, Dimitri. So the question is how to reach beyond your core Burning Man community into the default world community and attract them to support a project that might be, you know, the place of Black Rock City that they may never see. Um, invite them. Hmm. 
Um, I, you know, specifically, there's a really wonderful person that um, now is a part of our project. Uh, this uh, gentleman, Steve Hansen, and uh, we girls who love flaming things um, and need valves and stuff like that. We actually, you know, sought him out and he's like, "What are you doing with that?" And he said, "Come to the shop and see." Um, and sometimes, instead of just sitting there and explaining it, inviting them into the shop. That's happened, that's happened more than, you know, I mean, you know, more than I can count. For somebody who I was having an interaction with, like, yeah, what are you doing with that? Why are you putting those pieces together? Oh, it's an art project. And I, I just invited them to the shop. I said, come and see, see what we're doing. Participate in it. Let me teach you how to weld. Let me, you know, give you a tool. Um, let me show you how. And I would add on to that, um, give them, find the hook that's going to be interesting to them regardless of whether they ever see the art or not in the end. So, like, if, you, if you're doing a large-scale collaborative project and you're bringing in, like I was saying earlier, if you're bringing in people who don't have any skills with using, you know, wood-making tools or, or welding or whatever, you're teaching you know, people, especially kids, um, that is really a big attraction. To, to folks who, you know, it's like, I'm taking people within this community, I'm growing these kids' skills, and, 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 and just find what it is about your project that's going to resonate with them in that, in that kind of way. Does that make sense? And get comfortable with that 10 minutes, because you're going to say it a lot. You know, make sure you believe it, and you're asking them for money, so you've got to give them something, right? And in that 10 minutes is where you'll know if there's a relationship to have in that realm or not. And it's okay if they say no, because they probably will. Mm -hmm. Sort of a corollary to that is you don't, you don't always have to, have to ask for money. You can also get other kind of donations that you know, are as good as money, but still valuable to your, to your project. Right? Yeah, good. And one of the other things that I find really good, and just a quick background, so Start Some Good is another crowdsourcing platform. It's individuals, organizations, nonprofit, anyone who's trying to raise money to create a tangible social good in their community any form, art, organizations, whatnot. One of the things that we find very successful when we work with groups to create their campaigns and getting people to ask for money is that you're, you're essentially reaching out to your donors and inviting them to be part of something that's bigger than just you. It's bigger than who they are. They are, they are becoming part of something beyond, beyond just their dollar. And by engaging them and creating that light, the gift of light was an awesome idea. That's yeah. very, very cool. Um, but to, to letting them see how their participation is helping to make something happen, whether it's an art project, whether it's a group, whether it's anything like that, but creating it beyond just just the ads. It, it helps a lot. It's good. This is true. And if, you're, and if you're not burning the piece, you could find a place in your community to put it, and then that would involve people a whole lot more. You could generate more revenue potentially and beautify your, your city. Another great idea. Uh, let's go to Sam. Uh, most of the examples you've been talking about have been project-based or event-based or these tangible installation-based. I know you all both also have experience finding donors and sponsors for institutional administrative costs in your nonprofits, the way that NPR is asking for institutional costs. And I was wondering if you could speak to some of the differences in those relationships, how you find them and how you maintain them as compared to the more uh, one-off types of events we've been talking about. Operational costs are a hard thing to get funded. <laughs> so you surround your operational costs with a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> you put it just enough of a margin so you can cover your nut. Um, or there are some donor bases that are very, you know, foundations actually tend to, you know, have very specific um, focuses and some focus just on securing operational budgets for organizations. Um, but that is definitely the hardest piece. And part of it is you're creating ongoing relationships because ostensibly your organization will have a long a long tail. And so what you want to do is you want to have relationships that will continue to grow so you're not starting from scratch each funding cycle in terms of those very important operational <coughs> expenses. Yeah, operational <laughs> expenses are, yeah, they're not sexy. And they're really hard to create community around. Well, actually, 
actually not totally true. Sometimes um, getting people involved in operational expenses or just the expenses of like continuing on the nonprofit, that is a big community um, aspect. Um, you know, pitching it to somebody that like, you help us exist. We continue to exist because you're one of our, your, our foundations. Um, and cultivating those, reaching out to granting organizations and foundations that um, do uh, give organizational costs. So that's what I know Flux has been developing in the last um, couple of years. Is we've been kind of developing relationships with those key partners. And again, that word comes up again. Isn't as well as like just partners helping you do the fundraising. Your funders are becoming your partners as well. It's a very fluid dynamic between those two roles. We're at, are we out of time? Or close? We've got about five minutes before we close. Okay, great. Warren? So my question is, when you're doing an ask for somebody you've already set up a personal relationship with, can you talk about how you shift that into the ask relationship? Because you're kind of changing the, the dynamic and money has now entered. And how do you maintain that personal relationship but kind of get what you need to be clear with, with that intention of money. So the question is how you change, transfer the, your personal relationships into an ask kind of relationship situation. So I'm going to channel Christina Harbridge again, um, who coined the phrase, relationships are the most important currency. And you just, you just got to lean into it and, and hope and expect on your side of the relationship that by talking about money, you're not going to tie the results to whatever your personal relationship is. And um, and if you're not comfortable with that, then you probably shouldn't be asking them for money. Or, or you know, or partnership, or whatever the end result. If you're tied to an end result that could not materialize the way that you want it to, and then you feel like it could impact your personal relationship, then I think you make that decision before you go into the conversation. Because there's nothing more important than your friends. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, but I think if, if they are a relationship and they are a friend, just be honest. Say, I am starting to build something, I'm starting to create something that I truly believe in, and you've been supportive of, supportive of me in a personal way for all my life, and would you want to support this? I mean, it's a very direct question. Be direct and honest. That's all you really can be. It's real basic information, but it's, um, it's true. Okay. Um, hey, you. Uh, hey, Chicago. We have a nonprofit, and I'm really interested in setting up build space for events so that people can fly in, build a project, and participate more in our events. Have you, some of our community members work for corporations that have matching for donations to a nonprofit. You know, if you get 50, $25 a person, it becomes 50, 20 people, becomes $1,000 a month, which would pay for operational expenses. Have you um, experienced that, or what are your, what's the reaction to that? How does that work? Does it work? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, um, we all know people that work for larger companies, and I can thank Levi's and Apple and Adobe and Genentech um, for being partners, and we thank them. So we cultivate that. We're like, does anybody you know who is an employee um, have that ability to do matching funds? And we just put it out there, um, and we've had really wonderful results from that. Yeah, it's a great conversation to have with, with the corporations. Um, you know, with corporate conversations, you can talk about the marketing people, you can talk about their, with their foundations or their nonprofit arm or their employee relations. So that's a, it's a very strategic place to, to get to the heart and the soul of the corporation. It's great. Okay, so our last question will be from Esquire. If you're working with foundations, is there a website or an online library where you can go and search and put in like an artwork or Whatever, and find out which foundations, because there's so many. How do you find the foundation that could be associated with your 
There is, actually there's five of these centers around the U.S., the Foundation Center, and we're lucky enough to have one locally in San Francisco. They have databases, you, they are, um, you can go into their offices for free and do the research. They also have all of these databases that you can pay for um, to access. So the Foundation Center, I think, is a key um, place to start looking. And is there a court version of that also, or are, they, are the corporations in their database? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I'm Shin from Korea, and uh, I have a question outside. There are sections for, like, uh, credit for Becker in Kickstarter and other crowdfunding. And actually, many people want to give towards like, something like that to express, like, thank you for the Becker. So, uh, every time we